All right. Thank you so much, everybody. Paul, uh, very quickly, I mean, hopefully you can tell us what's uh, a little bit more from your perspective. I mean, what's going on right now? I know that you had to be working to protect some of your colleagues in Ukraine. So maybe you want to kick it off with that and then, you know, take it on. Thank you, Paul. Sure, Roberto. Um, and hi, hi, Paula and all. Um, yeah, the situation is uh, is bad. It's bad. With uh, Putin invading uh, Ukraine, uh, with, uh, you know, uh, some people being main targets there uh, because of their work exposing corruption, uh, both in Ukraine and Russia and uh, all across the former Soviet Union, there's a lot, a lot, a lot of fear for investigative reporters, for activists, for, for many, many people. Uh, the situation is obviously developing in a, in a very, very bad way. Uh, we're trying to help our colleagues. Um, you know, I mean, we're, uh, we're provisioning for these type of situations for, uh, for a long, long time now, but it's always, you know, when, when things really start, you know, it's, it's, it's always so different and, uh, it's, uh, it's so palpable and, it, and, and, and it's so, so sad, you know, for, for so many people. And again, uh, just like you, you know, many of those, uh, those journalists, uh, fighting corruption and organized crime, uh, in Ukraine, have families there, have elders, have, you know, so, so it's a, it's a very, very, very bad situation. And uh, what I'm seeing right now is, uh, from a point of view is, you know, it's, it's really an, um, an invasion, an invasion where kleptocracy plays such a, such a big, big part. I mean, you look, you look at Putin and his Camarilla, and these are people who amassed, you know, a lot, a lot of wealth over long, long periods of time. Um, and, you know, uh, and unfortunately, a lot of this wealth is parked in the West, in Western Europe, in the US, in other places. Journalists have, have exposed some of it. We have exposed some of it uh, at OCCRP. But there's so much more that needs to be done. And I think this is what, what we have to focus on uh, right now as investigative reporters in times of conflict. You know, it's, it's very important to understand what's at stake and why are people like Putin going for such gestures you know that are not just violent and and reckless but don't really have a logical fundament it's uh and at the end of the day kleptocrats uh you know are 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 just going at it you know without uh and with what they perceive as as impunity because of the feeble systems um that are put in the west you know to 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 protect uh protect the the, the citizens both in the places where the the wealth is stolen which is usually, you know, uh, countries that are developing uh, in, in development or, you know, the former Soviet Union, the former uh, uh, Eastern Bloc, uh, um, you know, Africa, South America, many countries there, Asia, all over the place. And, you know, unfortunately, um, as investigative reporters, we've also uh, failed in, in, in some sense because, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm really, really proud of, of the work that we're doing at uh, the Organized Crime and Corruption Reporting Project. And, we're obviously you know following organized crime and, and corruption but we're too few and you take all the networks together you take OCCRP you take OCCRP you, you, you take ICAJ you take CLIP you take Arige and uh, what it, it will amount to you know it's it's maybe 10,000 investigative reporters with the mainstream media overall you know um, and, and and I'm talking globally so this is I mean the numbers are are small the numbers are small and we need to be really strategic about what we're doing and about how we're thinking from now on um, about organized crime, about corruption and about how this can turn into violent conflict. Um, and it's always violence, you know, that accompanies uh, organized crime. And, and it's, it's always this intersection between corruption at the highest levels of, of the state and these groups, these criminal groups and the kleptocrats that come together and at some point, you know, it all kind of boils down and it, it goes towards this maelstrom that, that ignites violence. We're, it's, it's not the first time that we're seeing this, right? I mean, we're seeing violence and I, I think, Roberto, you've seen violence in Mexico for a long time, right? And it, it, it might not be such a, uh, such a large scale, but if you take a period of time in, in Mexico, you'll see that the number of bodies there is, is, is huge, unfortunately, and growing there too. So. I think um, what I'd like to, to, to address a little bit is, is exactly, you know, um, what got us here? 
um, I think, in terms of um, organized crime and, and high level corruption. And, um, you know, at, at, at OCCRP, we're studying uh, these issues for, for quite some time. Uh, for, well, we set up, uh, myself and uh, Drew Sullivan, my, my, my colleague and friend, we set up OCCRP um, almost 15 years ago. But we, we started working on organized crime and trying to understand uh, how this connects with, uh, with politics um, along, uh, I mean, long before that. Um, and there are a few conclusions um, that we, we kind of reached um, at OCCRP that show that, you know, organized crime and especially transnational successful organized crime kind of permeates decades. You go back to the 70s, back to the 60s, and you see some of the same networks of organized crime that are still in place. Now, unfortunately, many of these were, were established by the communist regimes during the Cold War. So organized crime always had this political kind of ideological sometimes function where you weaken your enemy through organized crime um, and you try to attack your perceived enemy through organized crime. With the collapse of the, of the Eastern Bloc, of the Soviet Union, uh, things changed a little bit um, and much of that organized crime became privatized, you know. And they became privatized by using, using the, the wealth that these countries amassed before the fall of the communism. So suddenly you had people in positions of power who had access to secret bank accounts, like the ones, for instance, that we exposed uh, just a few days ago. Um, as part of the Swiss Secrets uh, project um, that we've coordinated together with Süddeutsche Zeitung, uh, with The Guardian and, uh, and other media. So even if you look at that uh, data set, what you see is bank accounts going back from, you know, decades ago up to nowadays and people leaving off that money with, with impunity because if you don't deprive um, kleptocrats of their, and organized crime of their money, you're not doing anything. You can do here and there, you know, a little bit of action, like you, you investigate, you expose, there's someone who's gonna go to jail maybe for a brief period of time, but that's not gonna stick. That's not gonna make, you know, a big dent into what organized crime and corruption is uh, right now. So there's, uh, so one thing is this, you know, organized crime kind of permeates, you know, time in the sense that they build infrastructure for a very, very long time. And I'm talking here about financial infrastructure, logistical infrastructure, ship, uh, the shipping industry of the world. And these people have their channels of, of contraband, of, uh, you know, sending um, various um, uh, illicit kind of kind of goods, you know, from, from point A to point B, from continent A to continent, uh, continent B. And, and this, this, uh, this goes across geography. It, it goes to a place where you have no law enforcement. You never had law enforcement at that level, but you had for decades, for many decades, you had these transnational organized crime groups that were many times in the service of politicians like Putin, like many others. So the other thing is besides, besides this um, pervasiveness of, of organized crime is the fact that what helps them with their immense resources, I mean, if, 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 if you only take one transnational organized crime group and you look at their finances, you'll be amazed to see hundreds of billions. This is, this is money that they can spend at any time for whatever kind of use they need. So with this kind of finances, what they have access to is all this, what we call at OCCRP, the criminal services industry. You know, these are armies of lawyers, armies, you know, sometimes private armies, you know, security, former security officials, you know, who are hired guns and they have uh, access to knowledge. They have access to scientists. They have access to hackers. They have access to all sorts of people who can help them and who sometimes don't really care who they, who they work for. We define this as the criminal services industry um, uh, at OCCRP, but there's more to it. So there's time, you know, that they used and that they built, built up and built up and built up. There's the, the criminal services industry, and then there's the technology. Criminals are always early adopters of technology. You see them, you know, employing the latest, uh, latest technology with, with their networks from communication to the surveillance of communication. Sometimes these are state level kind of, kind of tools that they employ uh, in their daily work because they corrupt many officials in many, many countries that have access to this type of technology. There, there's also 
in our view, when uh, when we actually look at uh, organized crime and corruption, we see we see crime as almost a commodity, a commodity that's imported, exported across across geographies, across borders, across continents, but also across digital boundaries. You go to a to an illegal dark web market, you go to Hydra market, and you can find there from you know illicit goods, I don't know, from drugs to um, ransomware schemes, you know, software that you can employ to to rob people of their of their of their Bitcoin and, and so on. So the idea is that these people are always really well organized on the back of the of infrastructure that was built a long, long time ago. And this is not just I, it's, it's not like a, a simple conspiracy where you have some people, you know, some group of uh, organized crime elders coming together and saying, hey, how can we improve this infrastructure? You know, how can we build up more? How can we hurt more people? No, this is something that functions because this is almost like a parallel economy. It's almost, you know, it's, 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 it's almost like a place where you have, you know, uh, what we identified, for instance, as criminal angel investors, people who've already made a lot of money from crime, uh, maybe moved into politics, became, you know, uh, mayors of cities in Albania, let's say, which is actually the case. You know, it, it, it happened quite, quite a bit in, in Albania that organized crime figures became uh, public officials. Um, but these people, you know, amassed uh, really, really, you know, I mean, vast amounts of wealth. And with that wealth, uh, what are they to do? These people don't like to work. They don't like to work honestly. So they will put their money to work, you know, for them um, by sponsoring, by financing more crime. We've, we, uh, we're actually seeing uh, a few of these networks and we're seeing little. We should be, you know, uh, able to investigate a lot more, but there are so many, uh, so many hurdles um, on, on, on our way, uh, in, in, in our way. So these people, you know, just finance more crime and they breed more crime. And so it goes, you know, this, this money goes back into politics and then it foments all sorts of, uh, uh, of movements where if you really look right now at, uh, you know, there's a, there's a war between the globalists and the anti-globalists. And when you look at some of the people who are, you know, against globalization and against the elimination of borders, against migration and all this, and you look at them and they are some of the biggest businessmen when it comes to transnational business. So you wonder, well, wait, what's going on there? You know, I mean, these people have business all over the place, all over the, the, the world, you know, how come they are against this, uh, um, this, this type of thing, you know, where, where people can travel freely, where, where people can move, where, where they want in the world, where it's bad for their business. This is the answer. It's really bad for their business. So these would be the people that, I mean, people that you wouldn't expect in the first place to, you know, sponsor, finance, you know, very extremist movements, left or right, whatever, you know, they just don't care for them. The idea is to keep the borders in place and to keep them themselves sheltered. And because as I, as I actually said before, there's no law enforcement at the global level. I mean, imagine if there would be a global recall law, if there would be a law that would govern the earth where you could actually go after, org after global organized crime. Right now, what you have, um, and we've seen this over and over, is you have the, the Americans maybe going after a, a transnational organized crime group, but really only arresting the people who are affecting US interests. And then maybe you have the Brits doing a little bit and the Israelis doing a little bit, but this doesn't really matter for transnational organized crime because the network itself will be left in place. So unless we come together and create mechanisms, you know, to, to, to change that, you know, I think, you know, organized crime uh, will, will keep on flourishing. Now, on the level of, of journalism, what we're trying to do with our small but growing numbers um, is, is to kind of try to, to act where, where we can really have an impact. So what we did at OCCRP um, over, over the years was to develop um, technology that's, a, that's adapted and that's helping investig investigative reporting. Uh, we created a system called Aleph, uh, A-L-E-P-H dot O-C-C-R-P dot org. Um, I can send you this later or, or Roberto can, can share this with you. Um, but, you know, uh, this is a system that can ingest large volumes of data 
can analyze these, uh, these volumes of data and can spit out uh, results that help you with um, the initial part of your investigative reporting. In, in very broad terms, what you can do, for instance, is import into, into Aleph a list of um, the, the um, uh, people in the parliament in a country, and that list will be matched against you know, many terabytes of data, court records, company registries, leaks, and so on and so on. And the system will spit out instances where these names show up. Um, and it actually goes beyond that. It does entity extraction. It looks for you know uh, uh, bank accounts. It 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 looks it looks uh, will will adapt it right now to uh, to look for uh, crypto addresses, ether, Bitcoin, other 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 tokens uh, kind of addresses to extract them from documents and to match those against uh, the data that's in uh, um, that's in Aleph in the index there. So the whole thing is. The key right now to investigating efficiently organized crime and corruption is to use technology and to go between the virtual, the digital, and the physical, uh, you know, in a back and forth, in a continuous back and forth. It's still really, really important to have people in the field because, and I'm saying this all the time, no matter how much information we do have, you know, contained in databases, that's nowhere near how much we need to do our investigative reporting. A lot of the investigative reporting, you know, still sits on shelves in some, some office, some bureau of some government, of some local government, in a registry of the property that was not digitized and so on. So it, we always need to be, to be very conscious of, of this and to kind of move in between the digital and, and the physical, you know, in a, in a way where we gather information from both and we come back and match it and we come back and uh, observe to get down to the fuller story to, to obtain something that's um, uh, in the interest uh, of the citizens. So this mix of technology and groundwork is what really makes OCCRP function quite well with the numbers that we have. Um, the other thing is you can't right now, even if you're a, a you know, and I, I believe we're right now the largest investigative reporting network when it comes to investigating organized crime and corruption. Um, even if you're the largest network, you won't be able to move things on your own. So this is, for instance, where uh, our alliances come, uh, come into play. Alliances with other networks, with ICIJ, with uh, many media outlets, uh, Swiss Secrets um, was cooperation with many many media uh, and networks and this is what what gets you the story this is how you can move from continent to, uh, to continent from server to server from data point to data point and to 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 build something meaningful um but there's more than this and there's gotta be more uh, more to it than this um, and um i'll speak just briefly about our alliance uh with uh, with ti with transparency international right uh, that's called global, the, the Global Anti-Corruption Consortium, where we created this, um, this alliance with activists, investigative reporters on one side, activists on the other side. With the investigative reporters and the, the activists, you have the technologists working very hard, everything being uh, you know, based on a very solid foundation of uh, admin, of people who are good with numbers, who are, who are good with keeping an organization alive and keeping an, uh, an alliance al alive. But this, this is a place where a lot of impact happens, you know, this intersection between investigative reporting and activism. Because what we do right now is, uh, at OCCRP is greatly amplified by the advocacy that Transparency International is capable of doing. And not just this, as investigative reporters, we're focused on a story. We're focused on an issue sometime. We build up on our previous experiences, that's true. But someone who's working for TI might have a broader view, a, more, a, a fuller view on things. You, for instance, um, expose Danske Bank, like we've done a, a few years uh, ago, uh, and, and the corruption that was fueled by, uh, by Danske Bank, uh, by its subsidiary in Estonia. But someone at, uh, you know, very, very smart at TI, very clever at TI can say, well, you know, let's look at other banks doing the same kind of thing, you know, because if Danske Bank, one of the most prominent banks in Europe is doing this, I mean, it's, there's a, you know, high possibility, <laughs> unfortunate possibility that others uh, are doing the same. So the idea is to, to expand and 
to kind of use investigative reporting as a proof of concept. What we're doing with our stories is we're inspiring people to take up the fight, to take up the tools that we're building, to improve on them, to improve on the stories, to see the bigger picture, and to use our pieces of the puzzle that are very well documented because all our reporting goes through very thorough fact-checking and painful fact-checking, uh, goes through you know very painful lawyering, and obviously a very, very hard and uh, you know, time-consuming and money-consuming um, um, investigative process. So all this needs to be, to be used in a smarter way uh, in the world right now. We're giving the world these proofs of, 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 of concept. We're, we're giving these pieces of the puzzle, but it's really up to the, to the public and it's really up to other sectors to be able to put everything together and to build something that's much bigger than what we are uh, uh, providing. So this is just, just a few considerations about you know, how, we, how we shape our work uh, at OCCRP. And really, I just want to, uh, uh, to stress that the work done by our colleagues in, in Ukraine, our colleagues in Russia, our colleagues all over the place, because without them, you know, there's no network if you don't have really strong local investigative reporting. And this is unfortunately, as we see, what kleptocrats in countries like Russia want to eliminate first you know you mm. you gotta get rid of the investigative reporters you gotta get rid of the um, mm. um of the activists to be able to carry uh, uh carry on business like the criminal business that putin is is carrying right now mm -hmm. i mean this has been fascinating paul thank you so much i'm very conscious of the time so uh i will just quickly mention that um, i really appreciate how uh, you know you rounded up uh, with a lot of more detailed information, what uh, Dave Kaplan started saying that, you know, the, the levels of uh, kleptocracy and organized crime and therefore also the threats to investigative journalism and activists is something that, um, you know, was brewing since the 50s or perhaps the 60s, you know, when money was pouring in and when there were no real rules of the game in you know the beginning and in the thick of uh, of of the cold war so i just kind of wonder once again i mean having uh, having the experience right now of ukraine and russia and the western countries uh, just about to enter into a full force uh, conflict what is it that uh, we're going to be witnessing perhaps in 20 or 30 years time for the, you know the ones who are uh, the one, the, the ones of us who will still be around, but uh, we will have to see that. Let's pass the uh, microphone to our young journalist, to the J4G group, who is here. I'm pretty sure that uh, there are going to be a lot of questions. We got about ten minutes, so anybody wants to jump ahead? I think everybody's just kind of in awe about um, about um, this. Let, let me start by saying, I mean, one, one of the things that you and I have talked about a lot uh, since the beginning is that, you know, we, the advocates, uh, try to go for the long run. You know, like we are marathon players, we are pretty slow at the start, but try to go steady all the way until something actually changes in terms of institutions or laws, uh, so on and so forth. And investigative journalism tries to go for the 100 meters dash and try to create as much impact uh, as it's possible in that kind of a big uh, exposure. So as, as being part of the investigative journalism, um, uh, most experienced groups of all in the world, I mean, how do you see your, how do you see your work being, you know, changed by this collaboration with activists and, and with other entities. I mean, uh, I don't expect you to, to say that we are slowing you down, but I mean, are we, are we already in a point in which we can all together say that we are creating more impact or is there something more that we still need to do? Well, uh, um, you know, the answer is yes to both <laughs> your last two questions, because we are creating more impact. Uh, we need to do more. And about the, the marathon, um, it's, it's interesting, actually, because now that I'm thinking back at um, um, uh, the organization that I co-founded at OCCRP, when we started, me and Drew, uh, we were thinking about a sprint. 
we just jumped at the opportunity to investigate together to do this um you know investigative reporting in the balkans to do it cross border and then it just grew from there we uh, we never thought about you know at, the, at that point in time hey we're going to build this this organization you know that's going to work with hundreds of investigative reporters all uh, all over the world no we we, uh, we were just driven by our you know um, reporting by the fact that we needed to investigate organized crime and because organized crime is transnational you know it just naturally we grew organically in following it in following and uh, working more and more uh, with investigative reporters in countries where they couldn't do this type of reporting uh, for reasons of corruption for the lack of money or um, the lack of uh, uh, other type of means so i think this is um, uh, this is very very important I mean, building the network on a very solid ground that's represented by work work needs to be you know the foundation of everything but then what you have to do is to solidify the organization um we had to put a lot more structure into OCCRP to make it grow to 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 have it grow and to have uh, have it build alliances with other groups around the world so we worked you know we needed a director of partnerships <laughs> in uh, Camille Ice uh, we needed uh, you know uh, a new a new CFO uh, uh, our first actually CFO ever you know and and all that so we needed to put to put structure uh, with the organization because otherwise you just crash and burn you know, because investigative reporters can go for so long. If you don't have the structure in place where you ensure the security of your people, and I'm talking here about the physical security, the digital security, the legal security, that's very important. You got to have libel insurance, for instance, with your organization. You, you got to ensure a, a safe and a, a, a equitable workplace for this to work. You're against really great forces. You're against... Uh, organized crime you know and violent organized crime corrupt politicians who will want to kill you so the people working with you need to find a safe uh, safe space uh, to be able to keep working to be able to to build up and this is i think what we've done very well at OCCRP is to to learn from past mistakes from past investigations and to manage to deconstruct to reverse engineer organized crime so this took us to this place today where we're able to take, tackle almost any, any theme, any topic connected to organized crime. Just give us, you know, an intro, a little bit of, 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 of information about, you know, a group somewhere in Mexico, and we can investigate that. We can investigate that because we already know how organized crime works. And we know that organized crime is a commodity and we know how it functions. It always innovates. We have to keep you know, abreast with it, we have to, to learn. And this is the beauty of, of, of this investigative work, right? You're, you're always, always learning new ways. But what really enriched us, what, what took us to this place is the alliances with people from other sectors. Um, you know, I mean, activists with lawyers, with, with lots of, you know, human rights activists who were working in their own kind of, kind of places, you know, without communication, uh, communicating much with, uh, with, the, with the outside world. And connecting all these worlds is what the journalist needs to do. Before it was, you know, the journalist as this lightning rod, you know, the information comes to the journalist, you know, from all sides, and then the journalist decides what to do with the information. And, you know, it's going and, you know, it's sort of a Dick Tracy kind of thing. Well, you know, that changed and, and, and that changed for the better. So now I feel that the journalist is the, the connector, the unifier of all these worlds, but also the place where you can make sense of some of what's going on when it comes in in our case uh, you know uh, uh, with uh, uh, organized crime and corruption um, and be being able to fit that into the larger world is what makes us a little bit more impactful right now with our alliance with uh, with transparency international without other groups with global witness uh, and such so this this is important to keep on learning to keep on augmenting the network but not in the sense that you know you need this emailing list of you know a trillion people you need you need to build everything that you want to build based on work you you need to find those dedicated people and if you do the work you'll find those people mm -hmm. well thank you so much for that paul <clears throat> i'm getting a lot of questions and comments in in our chat box um is, i mean one of the co the questions coming from rachnish uh one of our kind of the stellar j4g founding members next question come from uh, saeed uba and also from Laura Dixon. I think that um, 
the, I will try to put the three questions together as one, um, because we have very little time. So uh, 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 sorry for that in advance to, to my fellow friends. But um, basically, we're asking, what, I mean, what is it that OCCRP actually does in terms of, a, you know, discipline so that um, you can, you know, remain safe, right? And the organization can remain safe. Um, second will be about how can you access information where uh, it's not available and, uh, you know, and you don't want to break any, any laws, but you still need to actually get access to information. And then lastly, that also has to do with, you know, security, but also has to do with, uh, in a more personal level, is on uh, how, how, does, how does this work, you know, impacts your personal life and the personal life of colleagues like you uh, in relation to safety and threats. You know, you are, at the end of the day, one guy in society with a family, et cetera, et cetera. So how, how do you put those boundaries there? Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, uh, these are these are hard questions. I'll I'll try and answer. Uh, <laughs> my ability. You have journalists. Um, You're talking to journalists. <laughs> yes. Yes. Of course. Um, so uh, first of all, um, what what keeps uh, OCCRP working is, um, as I mentioned before, this structure that we put in place by learning how organized crime works and how we need to investigate organized crime in a safe way. Um, we have clear rules, um, uh, safety rules, we have a safety manual, we have, uh, uh, we have also a fact checking manual, we have these rules in place where that are obviously uh, where we, uh, we can always improve, you know, but, but we do have a set of rules in place that keep, keep us going. So if someone starts working with OCCRP right now, they will be onboarded with a clear set of rules of how, for instance, to protect yourself against uh, surveillance. Well, we organize these counter, counter surveillance uh, uh, courses with, uh, with our people. And this is a very, very small part of uh, what we are doing. But the idea is that we, we build this family um, that functions on, on clear rules and where work is, 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 is rewarded. And this is, I think, I think most important to, to have this, um, this feeling that you're, you're part of this group. And I'm, I'm always amazed. I mean, I look at my colleagues right now and I'm like surprised by, uh, by the creativity. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at, at, at the younger colleagues and the ideas that they have based, you know, some data that we just received on some analysis that uh, uh, was just done. It's, it's amazing. I mean, you know, if you, if you really create a place for continuous investigative brainstorming, that will yield like a lot, a lot of good results. And all these people work in the public interest. And I think that's what keeps us going despite, you know, the, the burnout, despite everything. But you got to take in, into account all this, you know, the, the tear and wear of investigative reporting. Um, you got to give people a break. You got to give people access to um, counseling services sometimes. Um, there's, there's, there's issues, um, you know, you, you got to do your, your best. Investigative reporting is not a safe job. It will never be, but you gotta do your best to, to ensure a degree of, of safety uh, for uh, your investigative reporters. And this comes first from the network, from the fact that you're acting in a network. And if you feel that someone is exposed, for instance, tries to get some information in, in Sierra Leone uh, that's not available and you have to talk to a minister in, in the government or you need to, to talk to, to a local criminal, uh, what we do usually is we use people from outside of that country to gather that information. Um, and uh, um, I, I really like the, the, the question from Sierra Leone because that's where um, a lot of what we're doing right now at OCCRP started. It was a discussion in Sierra Leone many years ago with a local journalist when I was investigating, um, it was uh, in, in about 2007, I was investigating um, a very controversial businessman from Eastern Europe who went to Freetown and uh, had some investments in the region of Kono. And um, I was there uh, working with the local investigative reporter. And at some point, this reporter asked me, so, uh, you know, you, you're investigating this one guy here, you know, who has this mining, uh, uh, you know, rights and all this. But do you know that there are many others like him? How can we investigate the others? And I was like, wow, yeah, I mean, he's right. I'm coming here. I mean, investigating this guy because I'm interested in the guy because he's from my part of the world. You know, mm -hmm. that's what, I'm, uh, what I want to serve. I want to serve my public back in Eastern Europe. But 
this guy here is right. I mean, what do we do about the others? So this, mm. um, you know, uh, brought up the idea of how do we how do we help other investigative reporters, you know, do their work locally? And this is what spawned, you know, spawned all this OCCRP network and the tech tools. Um, that's uh, I, I came up, came up with this idea of this investigative dashboard of a due diligence kind of tool for the world, you know, due to that meeting in in, in Sierra Leone, in in Freetown, and 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 in Kono. So these these are you know great questions. Use the network, and sometimes it's much it's much easier to investigate the corruption in a country from outside of the country because one of the principles of that governs organized crime and corruption is that the thieves will not put the, the money in the same place where they stole it from so the money from sierra leone might be in the uk somewhere in property invested in london or uh, uh, might be you know in senegal or in uh, in uh, other countries and this is what what you need to do if you can't if, or if it's too dangerous to get information locally try work with colleagues you know in networks like OCCRP, like icaj like Arif, like many others and go from there and try to to pierce the corruption you know in your own country by coming from the outside that's 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 a safer and sometimes um, much more efficient way to doing it well th thank you so much paul uh to all i mean i'm really sorry we ran out of time but actually i mean this last q a and of course the whole of uh paul's presentation but the last q a is a fantastic segue to the next session that we have uh, i'm really happy to uh check you there in a minute let me just thank once again uh, Paul, uh, for not only you know the excellent presentation that you gave and for joining us, but also because of all the work that OCCRP has done throughout the years. I truly believe that uh, since the beginning of OCCRP and to date, we live in a different kind of world. And pretty much goes thanks to such a such a courageous job that you guys are doing. So thank you so much again. Thank uh, you, Roberto. Hola, all. Thank you very, very much. Yeah, and uh, let's meet uh, in the next room. So just kind of uh, leave this one, click on the sessions at your left, and let's um, and let's talk with Gypsy Gijen from CP CPJ. Thank you, Paul. Thanks. Thank you. Bye bye.